Hello, chemistry students. Today we are going to talk about phase changes. And by the end of this video, you should be able to identify all the types of phase changes and what kind of energy transfer they represent. So as I'm sure you're aware, there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Today we are going to explore more about solids, liquids, and gases and how substances can transfer from one state to another. And I'm sure that you have studied the states of matter in previous science classes, so I'm going to start by asking you a couple of questions. My first question is, what are the characteristics that distinguish gases, liquids, and solids? My next question is, how do substances change from one state to another? All right, so now let's go over some of the textbook definitions of these states of matter. Characteristics of a gas. According to kinetic theory, gas particles move constantly, and in a container, they often collide with each other and with the walls of the container. Second part of the kinetic theory is that gas particles travel in a straight line between collisions. And that a gas fills all of the available space in its container, meaning that it has no fixed volume and it will shift to fill whatever volume is available to it. In the next chapter, we're gonna study more about gas laws. So I want you to remember that it's these collisions from the kinetic gas theory which cause gas pressure. The collisions result in a little bit of force being exerted by the gas against the container. So the combined amount of force from all the gas particles is what causes gas pressure. The standard unit for gas pressure is the Pascal, um, and the pressure of the gases in our atmosphere, the pressures of the gases pushing down on us all the time, is actually equal to 100,000 Pascals roughly, or 100 kilopascals, but there are some other units for pressure that are also commonly used, and you should have them written down in your notes. We have one atmosphere, ATM, which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, and that is all equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So if you need to convert between any of these pressure units, this is the equation you will use to do that. Liquids. According to the kinetic theory, the kinetic energy in a liquid particles allow them to flow past one another. So they do have kinetic energy in them, but not as much as a gas. The second part of the theory states that liquid particles are attracted to each other. And this will cause the liquid particles to remain close to each other and have a definite volume. Whereas gases expand to fill whatever volume is available to them, liquids have a definite volume. And finally, the solid. We've been talking about solids this entire year, um, but unlike liquids and gases, solids do not flow, meaning they have very, very little kinetic energy. And the particles in a solid are all arranged in fixed locations. Okay, so now let's talk about how substances change from one state to another. And to talk about that, we're going to have to first talk about the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy states that in any chemical or physical process, energy is neither created or destroyed. If the energy of the system 
increases during that process, the energy of the surroundings must decrease by the same amount. So the energy of the universe is constant. Now there are many forms of energy that the law of conservation of energy applies to, but today we're gonna focus on heat. The textbook definition of heat is energy that flows from one object to another because of a temperature difference between the objects. Now there are two types of heat energy flowing and they are called endothermic processes and exothermic processes. Let's start by talking about an endothermic process. In an endothermic process, the system absorbs heat from its surroundings. In an endothermic process, the system gains heat as the surroundings lose heat. The opposite of that would be an exothermic process. In an exothermic process, the system releases heat to its surroundings. In an exothermic process, the system loses heat as the surroundings gain heat. So I have some drawings up here to help you visualize that. Let's call the boxes the system, and the circles around them can represent the surroundings. Now in the first one, the box is red and the surroundings are blue. And that's just supposed to represent that the box is a higher temperature than the surroundings. The system is at a higher temperature than the surroundings, which means that energy is going to move from the system to the surroundings. Meaning that this is an exothermic system. Now in the next one, the surroundings are red, which is supposed to represent a higher temperature, and the system is blue. So energy will move from the surroundings into the system. This is an endothermic. Okay, so we're gonna keep these little drawings in mind and we're gonna use them on the next slide. I would like you to sketch this triangle down in your notes and label one corner liquid, one solid, and one gas. We are gonna put titles to the phase changes. So each phase change has a name and you will be expected to remember what the name is and remember if it's an exothermic or an endothermic phase change. Okay, so let's start easy. Let's go between solid and liquid. When a solid moves into a liquid, that is called melting. And when a liquid changes into a solid, that is called freezing. Do you think that melting is an exothermic process or an endothermic process? Melting is actually an endothermic process because you need to add energy to the solid in order to move it into a liquid. So that one is endothermic, which means that freezing is the opposite. Freezing is exothermic. When you're moving from a liquid into a gas, that is called vaporization. And from a gas into a liquid, that is called condensation. Do you think that condensation is exothermic or endothermic? Condensation is actually exothermic because the gas has higher energy 
or is at a higher temperature than liquid. So energy needs to be moved from the system, from the gas, into the surroundings. Condensation is exothermic. That means that vaporization is endothermic. And finally, when a gas skips over the liquid phase and moves straight into the solid phase, that is called deposition. And the opposite of deposition, when a solid goes straight into a gas, that's sublimation. Do you think that sublimation is exothermic or endothermic? Sublimation is an endothermic process because energy needs to be added to the solid in order to get it into the gas phase. This means that deposition is an exothermic process. Please make sure that you have all the information on this slide copied down into your notes before you move on. Okay, so the relationship between solids, liquids, and gases of a certain substance in a sealed container can be represented in a graph called a phase diagram. This is the phase diagram for water. So you can look at this graph and you can see at any given temperature, and pressure what phase water should be in. This is where water can be expected to be a solid. The liquid phase is represented here. And this is where you can expect water to exist as a gas. Now I'd like you to note points B and C on this phase diagram. They're labeled as the normal freezing point and the normal boiling point. And that is because they occur at one atmosphere of pressure or one ATM. So at one ATM, you can expect water to transfer from liquid into gas to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. And you can expect it to transfer from solid to liquid or to freeze at zero degrees Celsius. Now, if you increase the pressure on your sealed container, you will actually not see boiling happen until a higher temperature. If you decrease the pressure, you can see water boil at a much lower temperature. And if you decrease the pressure far enough, you can actually see water go through the phase change of sublimation, where it goes straight from the solid into the gas. Now the next point on this graph I wanna point out is point A. Every phase diagram will have a triple point, and that is the point where the three phases meet. Now the phase diagram for every substance is different. On this slide, I have the phase diagrams of water and carbon dioxide just for you to compare. So at any pressure or temperature for this specific substance, you can see what state it should be in. And as we move forward this semester talking more about gases, 
I want to remind you about the Kelvin temperature scale, which sets absolute zero as the zero point on the scale. Right here. Can you tell me what you think absolute zero means? Absolute zero is the coldest possible temperature. It occurs at zero degrees Kelvin, negative 273.15 Celsius, and negative 459.67 Fahrenheit. Now, converting between Kelvin and Celsius is really simple because one degree Kelvin is equal to one degree Celsius. So if you're ever asked to convert between the two, you can use this equation. Kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273.15. And the reason that the Kelvin temperature scale is going to be ideal for our work with gas laws is because it doesn't include any negative numbers. So there will be no negative numbers messing up your calculations. Everything will be in the positive. So in the story problem, they may give you the temperature in degrees Celsius. So just remember that you need to add 273.15 to whatever that Celsius temperature is.